Today's guest played in the major leagues for 13 years and was the Indianapolis Indians hitting coach for three seasons. We're talking about catcher Butch Weininger. Back to talk to Butch in just a moment. Major League player and former Indianapolis Indians hitting coach, Butch Weiniger is our guest. Butch, it's great to see you. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing great, Howard. We're uh, The family's going wonderful. We're just uh, chilling and uh, just living life as it comes each day and everything. But uh, I'm watching baseball and uh, everything's going real good. What are your thoughts? You played in the big leagues to, for 13 years. What are your thoughts when you look back at your playing career? Well, I, I know one thing, Howard, and we talked about this quite a bit when I was in Indy, that uh, I, I'm very humbled when I look back at it. It's just something that uh, doesn't seem really real. I grew up trying to, I mean, baseball was my life. It still is. And uh, I grew up with the idea of playing in the big leagues one day, like so many kids did, I'm sure. But uh, to actually achieve it and spend 13 years in the big leagues, it was a dream come true. And I thank the good Lord for it every night. Now, you grew up in Pennsylvania, but near Baltimore. What major league team did you root for when you were a kid? Well, I was a Yankee fan. My dad was a Yankee fan, so, of course, I became that. Mickey Mantle was my idol. When we went and saw games, it was pretty much in Baltimore because it was only about 45 minutes away. So we got down there quite often when the Yankees were in town. I always tried to get Mickey's autograph. And um, so when Dad and I played in the backyard, it was always him pitching to me and I had the Orioles and the uh, Yankees lineup and not hit from the side of the plate that they hit from. And that was, that was our fantasy every day. You mentioned Mickey Mantle was your hero. The fact that he was a switch hitter, did that influence you to become a switch hitter? <laughs> it's, uh, they're, they're, it's the number one reason. There's no doubt. I was right-handed my very first year of little league ball. Dad and I were in the backyard after that, that eight year old season. And I just said to him one day when we were playing, I said, Dad, can I try to hit left-handed like Mickey does? And Dad was – he didn't tell me then, but he was thrilled. And he said he was going to give me another year or so, and he was going to suggest himself. So I wanted to be like Mickey in so many ways that um, the first start was to try to hit, be a switch hitter and hit from both sides of the plate like Mickey did. And one of the great things about being a switch hitter is you never have that breaking ball going <laughs> away from you. <laughs> You know, I, I never experienced it, and um, thank good Lord, I never did have to experience it. Uh, I would have had to make a lot of adjustments. There's no doubt about it. So to have the breaking ball coming into me and not worry about hyperextending my body to try to stay on the breaking ball going away, uh, it was a big advantage. And uh, it was probably one of the main reasons I got to the big leagues as quick as I did. Well, speaking of that, you signed a professional contract with the Minnesota Twins. And then you do something that no catcher ever had done before. <laughs> you go from class A ball to the major leagues. Butch, please tell us that story. Well, Howard, you know, as we talked many a times, it was a whirlwind year. Um, I went away from home for the first time when I graduated high school uh, to Elizabeth in Tennessee. I won the batting title there. I came home. I went to Reno, Nevada, high A ball the next year. We had a phenomenal team, and I had a great year and came in second in the batting title. So I was 19 years old, and um, I got a letter in the mail one day from Howard Fox, our general manager, basically congratulating me on the success that I've had so far with the Twins. And he said, because of your success, you are cordially, and I always, like I always told you, I always remembered that word, cordially invited to the <laughs> 1976 Major League Spring Training Camp. And... I was floored. Mom and dad were just beside themselves. And, um, you know, I just thought it was another stepping stone in my career, go down there get looked at. And I found out later on that Gene Mock took the team over that year. And uh, he thought his catching, the catching position was a little light. And he asked Calvin Griffith if we had any other catching help in the minor leagues. And he said, we only have that one of your kid. And he played a ball last year. So I owe this man, Gene Mock, so much to have him invite me to spring training to take a look at me. And he, he caught me quite often, almost every day in spring training. And Howard, like we talked about, I, I never thought about making that team. And I had a good spring. I was facing guys I grew up watching. I was on top of the world. 
And he called me in towards the end of the spring training and finally just told me, he goes, I'm going to take you north with me. And uh, I thought he was joking. I had no clue what he was saying. But a couple of days later, I was in the opening day lineup in, uh, in Texas against the Rangers and facing Gaylord Perry. And I'm going, oh, my gosh. But uh, that whole season was a whirlwind. Gene stuck with me. I struggled to begin the season for about the first month. And then I caught fire and um, had, a, had a good rookie season. That was 1976. And I believe mm -hmm. you were runner up for rookie of the year to a man named Mark Fidrich. I was. I faced Mark a number of times. I, if I remember correctly, I thought we as a team, we had some success against Mark and everything. He was basically a sinker slider guy who had really good command, could spot the ball where he wanted it, kept it down. But uh, I never got to know Mark really personally, but uh, I admired the guy. I mean, the, the way he packed stadiums. If I had to come in second to rookie of the year that year, Mark had a tremendous year winning 19 games. I, I could, I, I, I had no beef whatsoever. And you made the all-star team. What was that experience like as a rookie making the all-star team? Well, like, like, I told, like I told you, Howard, I struggled for the first month of April. I was scared to death. I was afraid of runners running on me. I, I had passed balls. I was barely hitting 200. And like a lot of the kids that I, I, I worked with over the years, I told them sometimes you need a little break. You need a little thing that's kind of, boost your confidence and maybe something tells you that you do belong there. And for me, it came in a two day span when I hit my first major league home run in Yankee stadium off a of catfish hunter to win a game and to do it in Yankee stadium, Howard, it was the team I grew up watching and just know the history of the game. Uh, and then the next night we went back to Minnesota and I hit my second one off of Jim Palmer of the Orioles and Jim Palmer never let me forget that either. But um, that was the light bulb for me that finally I said, I can play here. I can hit here. And um, I went on and was elected to the All-Star Game by uh, Daryl Johnson of the Red Sox uh, with a lot of help from Gene Mock, I believe, too. And it was, um, it was in Philadelphia, close to home, so mom and dad were able to come and see me and, and watch the game. And uh, I got the pinch hit. And then a, a former, another teammate down the road with the Yankees, John the Count Montefusco, was my, was the guy I faced. And uh, I drew a walk off of him, and uh, I think the National League thought I was the American League Pete Rose the way I ran the first base. So, uh, <laughs> tremendous, tremendous experience. I'll never forget it. Well, you caught so many games for so many years, and one of the things you told me is you would catch both games of doubleheaders, mm -hmm. which is unheard of now. Now, the minute there's a day game after a night game, a catcher <laughs> gets a day off. Tell us what Gene Mock would say to you between games of a doubleheader. <laughs> Gene was awesome. Um, he, he was a man of little words, but when he had words to say, he would, he would say them, whether they were good or they were negative. Uh, but you knew where you stood with him. And if uh, Gene was a man who, who really had a desire to win, he, he really wanted to put the best team on the field every day. But if I was playing well and we had a double header, I mean, he would do nothing more than walk by me between games and look at me and just say, how you feeling? And I knew exactly what that meant. He didn't have to say anything more. And I said, I feel great, Skip. He was okay, you're in there a second game. No arguments, no nothing or anything. I, I, was, I was proud to do it. Do you ever say to yourself, you know, you're, in, you're catching, it's hot, you've got all that <laughs> equipment on. There's seven guys in the field, those position players, all they're doing is stand there. Look at how hard I'm working here. You know, you know, I, my, my junior year in high school, before my junior year, I had a White Sox scout come to me and say, listen, I was playing third base and pitching at the time. And he told me, he said, listen, you want to play in the big leagues, kid? I said, yes, sir. That's my goal. And he said, well, take it for what it's worth. I really believe your future is behind the plate. And he pointed towards home plate. He said, a switch hitting catcher with a good arm can go fast. And I owe this gentleman so much and everything. And my high school coach agreed with him. So catching was the gateway to the big leagues for me. There's no doubt in my mind. I don't know if I'd have made it at third base, but uh, I had enough quickness behind the plate to be able to be a big league catcher. Howard, there's a lot of days that, were, that was hot and smoking out there. And I would just think about Dave Rigetti's no hitter in 83. It was hot. And, um, 
but you know what? I love to sweat. I, I did not mind it. To this day, I, I love to go work out and still sweat. Uh, if I don't sweat, I don't feel like I did anything. So uh, there was a lot of days, but I just knew it was part of the, it was part of the job. And, um, you know, that's why the second half of the season, I probably wore down a lot and everything. And um, my stats went down a lot the second half of the season. I just didn't stay strong enough and everything, but I wouldn't change a thing. I think they know more about that in this day and yeah. age with weightlifting and so forth to keep yeah. catchers stronger during the second half. There's no doubt. I mean, for me, I thought, and, and nobody said anything different, that catching every day was keeping my legs strong. Well, after I retired, looking back and started seeing what these guys were doing now with lifting and squatting, and it, it was to keep their body strong. I was wearing my legs down by catching every day, and I didn't realize that. And I just knew, wow, it's a long season. My legs are tired. And, uh, but that hurt me in the batter's box because I, I, I struggled to keep my legs underneath me and, and really rotate into the ball the way I wanted to with my legs. It just wasn't there. So uh, it ended up being a lot of upper body hitting and everything. So I tell, I start, when I got into coaching, I started telling catchers, I said, do me one favor. As strong as you think you are and everything, please can you continue to do something for your legs all season long, two, three times a week, get in there, do some squats, do some leg extensions, something to keep them strong because you'll thank me for it at the end of the year. Nicely said. We'll have more with Butch Weiniger. This is WHMB TV 40. Indians hitting coach and a man who played in the major leagues for 13 season seasons. Bush, you mentioned you grew up a Yankee fan. What was it like when the Twins traded you to the Yankees? Well, it was a, it was a period of time that uh, it wasn't a – well, the trade itself wasn't a complete shock because there was a lot of rumors going on at the time. Uh, Mr. Griffin, Calvin Griffith, the owner of the uh, Twins at that time, uh, was – was saying that he was going to probably sell the team at the end of the year. Uh, Calvin was a good man. He just was one of the last of the dinosaurs, they called him, that loved his money. He wanted to make as much money as he could. And uh, he started trading off, you know, his, quote, high high price players. Um, Rob Wilfong and Dougie Corbett were traded to the Angels. Roy Smalley was traded to the Yankees. Uh, so we, Roger Erickson and I were next in line and we kind of knew something was going to happen. We were in the Metrodome that year. And I remember going down to check the lineup card as I went out on the field and I didn't see my name in the lineup. And I'm thinking, son of a gun. And then I looked at the extra man below it and I don't see my name in there anywhere. And I, and I'm going, uh Oh, something's happening. And I, I swear it was like five seconds later, one of the clubhouse kids peeked around the corner and he says, Hey, Butch, um, they want to see it in the manager's office. And I went, okay. Well, the rumor at that time, Howard, was Cleveland. I, I had heard rumors that maybe we were going to be traded to Cleveland. So when, I, when we got into the uh, manager's office and everything, we sat down and uh, he, pardon me for forgetting his name and everything. Um, I forgot his name offhand. But anyway, he starts talking to us and saying, guys, I think you knew this was going to happen. This is going to be a, you know, a good thing for both of you. And Roger and I kind of looked at each other and, all this time, I'm thinking, okay, what's Cleveland like? And um, he says, you guys are going to like it in New York. And everything stopped. Rods and I looked at each other. He goes, you guys have been traded to the Yankees. So part of me was like, holy cow. And the other part was like, oh, my God. And because uh, there was a lot of things we heard about in New York. We didn't know if they were true. The Bronx Zoo, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, they said, they were in Oakland at the time. They said they need you in Oakland right away. So we had to fly out the next morning to Oakland. And uh, I remember calling mom and dad. <clears throat> dad was thrilled. Dad, dad was pumped. And uh, mom was scared. And the first thing she said was, you're not going to that Bronx Zoo, are you? I said, mom, mm -hmm. I got no choice. We, I've been, we've been traded to the Yankees. So part of it was a big, big thrill because being a Yankee fan growing up. And it turned out great. I remember... 
happened to wait till we got back to New York to put the pinstripes on because I wanted to see myself in the pinstripe. And I probably stood in front of the mirror like 15 minutes, just admiring the <laughs> pinstripes on me. But uh, what, a, what an experience. A lot of ups, a lot of downs. It was everything that I heard. And um, Goose, Goose Gossage gave me the best piece of advice when I first got there. He said, Butch, Mr. Steinbrenner is going to say things to you, about you in the paper. Do everything you can to forget about it. Because two days later, he's going to forget he even ever said it. And that was just the way George would just say whatever came to his mind at that time. And that turned out to be great advice. And I got along, I got along really good with Mr. Steinbrenner. So it, it was a thrill, though. Five years in New York was a thrill. Let's go to July 4th, 1983. You caught Dave Vergetti's no-hitter. Take us back to that day. Well, Rags, Rags, he was a guy that had trem tremendous stuff. He was a he was a tremendous arm, uh, could get a little erratic and everything, but uh, big guy, threw hard, hard slider. He also had a curveball and he had a changeup. And we were facing the Red Sox. And looking back on it now and everything, I don't, the only thing I can really say for about that day was I thought the stars were aligned. To, to be July 4th in Yankee Stadium against the Red Sox, and then be Mr. Steinbrenner's birthday. It was like, wow, how could this, could this script even been written any better? But it was a hot, humid day, 40 some thousand people in the stands. Um, Red Sox were a tremendous team at that time. A lot of power hitters, good hitters with Boggs leading off. And then Jimmy Rice and Tony Armas. I mean, it was a good lineup. So it was, it was a, it was a, it was a game that we, we had to be on the top of our, you know, top of our game and everything against them. And it was one of those days where Ragsy just really had good stuff. Overpowering fastball, hard slider. The thing I always say was, and I've watched the replay of the game quite a bit and everything, just to get a feel for it and everything. Rags had him overmatched. And the fact that we could throw his curveball in there now and then and throw his changeup in there, I think really, really helped keep those Red Sox hitters off, off balance. And they couldn't just sit on his hard stuff and on his fastball. And, um, I had Stevie Palermo umpiring behind me. I always loved Stevie. I thought Stevie was the best umpire in baseball, and he made things light for me back there. So we did a lot of talking back there, too. So tremendous day. I still to this day, Howard, can feel that ball hitting my glove when Boggs struck out to end the game on that 2-2 slider. And um, I still feel myself jumping up in the air and watching Rags just look like a ton of bricks just fell off his back. Tremendous. Tremendous, and, and did know that there was not a no-hitter since 1956 when Don Larson threw his no-hitter in the World Series. Kind of, kind of put a little, uh, little ice cream on top of, the, top of the whole thing. That's wonderful. And then two yeah. years later, final day of the season, mm -hmm. you caught F Phil Negro's 300th victory. Probably two. Those are two of my biggest experiences in New York that I uh, really, really think about quite often. And uh, the Phil Negro one and everything was was so unique that um, Phil pitched that whole game in Toronto with, without his knuckleball. And uh, it was a dream that he had to always do it. And he told me that morning he was going to do it that day. And I, I said, Phil, come on, you're going for 300. Why do you want to do this today? He goes, Butch, I just want to do it. And I just remember I, I still use my knuckleball glove even though I know he wasn't going to throw any knuckleballs, but just in case somewhere he got a wild air that he wanted to change his mind, but he didn't change his mind to the last hitter of the game. And that's when he uh, told me on the mound, he goes, I want to finish this off with a knuckleball. So what baffles me or what, what really I admire was never throwing one knuckleball the whole day in the bullpen between innings in the game. And then all of a sudden break out four or five knuckleballs and strike out uh, Jeff Burroughs to end the game and he's I, I still got the glove in my den here he uh, he signed it for me after the game to Butch to a big man with a big glove Phil Negro number 300 <laughs> and uh, awesome I ran into Phil we, we talked to Phil a number a couple of times since then but uh, when he was in India and everything just a tremendous human being uh, it was a sad day when he passed away but I have I have such fond memories of that of that time right there what are your thoughts when you look back at your post-playing days? You were a big league hitting coach with Milwaukee and Indianapolis Indians hitting coach, a hitting coach for AAA Scranton with the Yankees for eight years. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I got out of the game. I retired, I retired at 32. I was, I had feet problems. 
Uh, it got to the point where I, I struggled to squat and even even run or walk. So I took that as a sign it was time to, to uh, hang it up. I got into the golf business. I wanted to become a PGA uh, uh, teaching pro, and I was going to just try to find a job somewhere at a golf course, and uh, that was my second love. Well, about a year, year and a half after that, I started missing baseball, got the opportunity to get back into pro ball after coaching two years at Rollins College, where I found out that I really enjoyed it. And then after those two years, 26 years went by, and uh, the last 21, I'm just doing hitting. And Howard, I, I, I can honestly tell you, I never had a bad year. I never had a year go by where I just said, boy, I dislike this. I, I struggled this year. There were so many things to help these young guys and everything. And the guys who got to the big leagues and even a lot of the guys who didn't, I still hear from nowadays. And uh, that's the fun part, the, the, the friendships that we bonded and everything came, came into. I, 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 26 years of coaching, I never thought it would happen, but it was really a thrill for me. Butch, it was great spending time with you. I got to know you when you were in Scranton and being with you every day in Indianapolis was great. Uh, I treasure our friendship and I thank you so much for coming on today. Howard, you're the best, man. I, I'll do anything for you. I value your, your friendship too. Anything I ever do for you, please let me know. Thank you so much. That's Butch Weininger and this is WHMB TV 4. thank our guest, all-star catcher Butch Weininger. See you next week on Kelman's Corner where we'll talk more baseball.